Um, so Sarsen's farm is in Lambourne, which is known predominantly as a, a, the headquarters of jump racing. Was it a conscious decision to be here and not Newmarket, which would be the logical, you would have thought the logical place to be as a flat yard? Um, well, we actually very first started uh, down in Whitsbury, which is where Desert Orchid was trained and David Ellsworth and then Rafe Beckett had all that success. And we started in a very small yard there and sort of outgrew it after a couple of years. And it was really at looking where was the opportunity to, to go next. And um, the Jockey Club had bought the Lambourne Gallops probably three or four years before that. And they'd really invested a lot to bring the standard up to similar to what they have in Newmarket. And they offer a new market. So, um, and it just happened that there was a yard that was the right size for us to rent um, to take that next step from, from where we were. Um, and so we, so we went there. Um, I wouldn't say it was a yard that totally worked for us, but the plus was we were riding past this every day, and that was still in the days when Claire and I used to ride out a lot, and I used to forever be saying, oh, we should, we should really look at that, we should really look at that. And then eventually it sort of became like, okay, well, you know, we're, we're paying rent, actually, and we'd be better off paying a mortgage. So what, was it sitting here empty all that time? Um, yeah, it was a sort of derelict farmyard, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, the jockey club were actually using it at the time to store tractors and things like that. And it, I mean, we, I'll show you the picture afterwards, but you know, the, the whole thing was just collapsed buildings and you know, there was a lot of asbestos sheds that needed removing and things like that. But. Okay, now you've mentioned the word science already. Uh, would it be fair to say you're a science and data driven yard? Well, I've been told that you are, but I'm hoping you <laughs> confirm that. <laughs> uh, we're both very analytical people. Um, I think coming into racing, having had a very scientific background um, and hearing other sports, you know, in terms of the data they're using, it is surprising or was surprising particularly then that the use of data and information was kind of sh slightly shunned in racing. It wasn't attractive um, and to us that seemed to be a real edge um, to push hard into. Mm. Um, naturally, we enjoy it anyway. Um, the amount of information you get is incredible and you're always learning and I think we both love that challenge of coming across new ideas and going oh wow you know when you suddenly it's just pieces of a puzzle and equation and going actually when you suddenly add that into that equation it all suddenly makes sense uh, it's very rewarding and satisfying you know we've had some really good luck with some older horses that have come to us and it's having all those pieces of scientific information and analysis of ourselves understanding form, but also adding in the horsemanship of your team, adding in the facilities of Sarsen Farm, we've done really well. And horses, we've got a horse, Anderleaf. I mean, he arrived rated 65, and he's now in the 90s. He's won eight races and over 100,000. 94, in, I'm told. In less than two years, you know, and that's as an older horse. Um, and, yeah, it's satisfying to you know, show that all those decisions and thought processes that you made were right. Um, but you're always pushing. You always want more. Mm. You can't sit and think, oh, yeah, I know everything. And that's what horse racing is great, because no one ever knows everything. I've had, I've had my card marked with some of the things that you do, which are probably more unusual. Do you mind if I run through them and you can sort of <coughs> explain if I've got, first of all, if my cards were marked properly? And, uh, <laughs> And then if, you know, what, just a little bit about each, is that okay? We'll yeah. give it a go. <laughs> right, sectional timing on the gallops. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, I mean, it's fairly obvious, but, um, you know, it's understanding how fast your horses have gone and you can, visually, you can see a lot, but, you know, our main work gallop, you can see the last five furlongs. So if they're working over six or seven, you can't really see it very well and they're a long way out, away from you. And actually, by the time the horses get to you, if they've gone hard early and they come past you, more, more steadily and you can go back and look at those times you then understand okay well that's why that happened equally if they fly past you like Frankel but actually it turns out that they've walked along for the first three or four furlongs well you know you can probably downgrade them a little bit so it's understanding the horse you've got because once you understand the horse you've got you can plan a campaign for that horse to achieve the best results possible okay heart monitors and recovery time yeah, it's really interesting looking at the recoveries. Um, the monitors that we were using have been superseded by another company now that we have started with. 
and their data is incredibly accurate. Um, and yeah, I think over the years, you need the more data you have, the better you can analyze it and make informed decisions. And certainly getting horses like Astro King in the yard and just seeing his recovery time, it's just phenomenal to watch. You know, your average kind of recovery of a horse would be one minute 40, say, after a gallop, you know, a decent gallop. His is 45 seconds, you know, and that's just showing inside him, you know, when you're at the sales, all you can see is the outside of the horse. You can see its temperament a bit, but you see its biomechanics, how it moves. What you can't really understand is their heart. Um, and by using equipment like this, you can start actually talent spotting at home and saying, wow, this horse's recovery is insane. Um, and I think particularly when you're going over the more 10 furlong and upwards trips, if you've got an incredible heart, that's only going to be a huge advantage for them to get that aerobic system working. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, you're measuring fitness, but there's also sort of calculations thing, and things you can do that help you understand horses' ability as well. Um, and that's, again, a, a, you know, a very useful tool in, in understanding the talent and then how do you develop that horse as it goes through its career. Can, can you measure it after an actual race? I mean, people say the horse hmm. blew for a bit. Can you, can you sort of utilise it as well? You, you could, um, but you'd have to go and sort of listen with a stethoscope and, and things like that. But, you know, hopefully going into the race, you know how fit your horse is and where it is. And, you know, you'll have an idea of, you know, there's no doubt there's nothing like a race for really, you know, bringing a horse that last little bit forward. Um, but, you know, you can do it. You, you, you can get a horse very, very fit at home if you want to. Um, it probably doesn't suit the, you know, the way we, we campaign horses a lot of the times have them, you know, the first time they run every year, absolutely fit to the, you know, because people like a day out at the races and they like going racing. And if you've, if you've thrown everything out so that the first run of the season is the, is the derby, you know, is, is, is the absolute pinnacle of what that horse is going to achieve, you know there's also with fitness you're always pushing right to the limit and then there's a has to be a recovery afterwards so if you do that for the first run of the season you know where do you go next with it and you know racing is yes it's about being competitive and winning but it's also about giving owners you know days to enjoy and go and compete and hopefully you can get it right so you can win your first race and you'll improve and go and win your second race and your third race i've i've um I've written down young horses gene testing in fibres. I've probably missed that. <laughs> I've probably missed that. It sounds like a breakfast, doesn't it? But uh, t tell us about. Have I got some of that right? Um, so there's genetic testing done over in Ireland. Um, I think they do a whole range of different tests, but one that we have found to be incredibly useful and it's about 80% accurate um, is what they call the speed gene test. Um, so you're really looking at your muscle fibre makeup in your racehorse. So how much fast twitch have you got versus slow twitch? Um, and they've actually been able to plot now, looking at that fibre type balance, whether you're kind of more orientated to speed trips, middle distance or staying. Um, so it's been a useful tool really, hasn't yeah. it? Particularly when you've been sent a horse at the previous connections kind of didn't quite know what trip to run the horse over. By doing that test, it can help you narrow it down and confidently go, yeah, I think this is right. So for example, Astro King, when we bought him, his form over 10 furlongs hadn't really worked out. Um, but actually, if you looked at the stride data and you actually said in the form, well, hold on a minute, you know, he lost a shoe that one day, he finished lame another day, he ran on soft ground another day. It makes you think, mm, maybe it is worth trying 10 again. But by doing this genome test, he came back as what they call a CT. Um, you get one gene for your mum and one from your dad. C's for the speed and T's for the slow twitch. Um, he was a CT, which is kind of 10 to 12 furlongs. Um, so it gave us confidence to say, yes, come on, let's give this another go. Let's go 10 furlongs. Um, and actually, William Buick last year got off him and said, you could try 12 with him. So it's nice to have that up our sleeve, you know, to hopefully try at some point this year. I've been nodding away when you've been saying slow twitch, but you're going to need to explain what that is. <laughs> yeah, so to explain, um, basically, there's, in the simplest terms, there's two different types of muscle fibres. There's slow twitch muscle fibres and fast twitch muscle fibres. So fast twitch muscle fibres are what give you the power to sprint and be fast, and slow twitch are more based for stamina, so you, know, so you can go a distance. Um, will we... Does it make sense? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and you can have different proportions of those muscle fibres. 
And what these genes do is, if you've got what they call the CC genes, they're coding for fast-twitch muscle fibers. So you have more fast-twitch muscle fibers. Whereas if you have the TT genes, which are the ones that code for your slow-twitch muscle fibers, so if you've got two of those genes, then you're going to have more slow-twitch fibers. So you're going to be more suited to stamina type events. And then if you've got one of each, you're sort of somewhere in the middle and you're, you're, you're middle distance. Uh, am I assuming that this sort of information isn't something you can get from a horse that you're thinking about buying from the sales book? Um, you, you can. There are, there are people who sort of go and pluck hair and, and sort of run it through a DNA analyzer at the sale. It, it's pretty expensive to do it. Um, and, you know, you'd probably realistically need bigger budgets than what we're working with to make it worthwhile, if that makes sense. And really, to some extent, it doesn't matter. It's when you get the horse home and you want to work with that horse and how are we going to develop it it's a piece of information that's really useful because you know we're just starting to do some quicker work with some of the two-year-olds but if you understand that one of those two-year-olds is a tt it's not really going to be suited or you know there's always exceptions but it's unlikely to that you're going to see the best of that horse until it can run over a mile and a quarter mile and a half next year you're probably going to train it differently to one if that's looking like, you know, genetically should be a five or six furlong horse and is showing you those kind of signs. Um, you know, it's, it's part of the puzzle because um, I'm sure you, one of your questions is going to be about um, looking at stride patterns. The very next one. Well, there you go. So should we go on to that? <laughs> um, <laughs> but basically, it takes a lot of the guesswork out. So you, you save time by knowing or having a good idea. Yeah rather yeah. than having to try and find out what trial and error. Whether you're betting or whether you're training horses, a lot of it is probabilities. Uh, there is no perfect exact science, and it's just getting those probabilities in your favour. So having more information like yeah. this, you know, yes, it might, you might be in the 20% where it actually doesn't work. It's not the right thing to work from, but if it's 80%, that's pretty high. <laughs> okay, so as anticipated, stride length and stride <laughs> cadence. So it's, again, it's another piece of the, the puzzle. Now, stride length, obviously, if you're taking longer strides, you're probably moving faster unless it's taking you longer to take those strides. So, but what you find is that most, most decent horses have a fairly decent stride length, and there's sort of you know, measurements that indicate if a, if a horse can stride over this distance um, when it's going at a certain speed, it's, it's probably got some ability, provided it can sustain that length of stride for long enough. And then the other bit is um, cadence or turnover. So that's the number of strides you take per second. So if you take lots of strides per second, you're very powerful, more likely to be a sprinter than if you take a stayer. And if you think about human runners as well, you can kind of visualize it. A stayer, you take those big, long, smooth strides, but you can only you take less of them a second. So if our stride length is seven meters and we're taking 2.2 strides per second, we're gonna cover less ground than if we take 2.5 strides per second. But, so the speed is higher when we're taking more strides. The payoff is, is that from an energy capacity side of things, obviously you're burning more energy to get that turnover. So there's a biomechanics sort of optimum stride pattern for each horse and that will vary from horse to horse so the ones that are t with the high turnovers will be the faster sprinters and the ones with the slower turnover will be our stayers 